the Humble Duck Decoy. For some, it's a collectible artifact of Americana. For others, a tradition handed down from generation to generation. For decoy carver J.P. Hand, a way of life. Uh, there, there's certain common mistakes. That every for 40 years, for me to take people out gunning or for me to sit home and carve decoys is like paying someone to play basketball. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's something I'd want to do anyway. I'm making a, uh, a tool that uh, some people still use for its intended purpose. A lot of times, they, uh, for most of the time, they're bought for their decorative value, folk art value. JP, Jamie to his friends, has been carving ducks from Jersey White Cedar for about 40 years. You can't ask for a better wood than Atlantic White Cedar. We call it Jersey Cedar or Swamp Cedar. It's a, a soft wood like white, somewhat a white pine, but it's naturally rot resistant. And that's why it's used for boat building, uh, cedar clapboards, the cedar roofs are the, the same wood. Most decoy makers in South Jersey, we still carve by the traditional methods. Uh, all, the, our decoys are almost entirely made with hand tools. Hand learned his craft from two masters, Hurley Conklin and Harry Shorts, a third generation decoy carver and NEA National Heritage Fellow. In that tradition, he's taken on an apprentice, Dave Billing. I'm the chairman for Ducks Unlimited, which is a wetlands conservation organization. And I'm the chairman for Cape May County. And uh, pretty much I used to, I've been doing that since I was 18 and uh, now I'm 25. So I used to go around asking local carvers for donations for our banquets. And um, someone told me about Jamie Hand, so I wound up coming here and knocking on his door and asking him if he would donate a decoy. So this brand you're making, Dave. And pretty much um, we hit it off then. And uh, he told me to come over and we carved together and um, I've, been, I've known him since and I come over often and carve with him. I've been teaching other people to carve almost as long as I've been carving. And, uh, you know, I've taught seminars at the Philadelphia Maritime Museum and uh, Wheaton Arts and different places. But every now and then I'll see someone like Dave Billig. He, uh, he has a knack for it. And uh, it doesn't just take the, you, you not only have to have the talent, but you have to have the drive. And a lot of people, st you know, pick up, like many of us do, that we'll st play around with a hobby or a pastime and we lose interest. But every now and then I'll meet someone that has the talent and they also have that, the drive to stick with it. We visited JP's restored colonial era farm during one of their sessions to get a first-hand look at a centuries-old craft that originated in the United States and, some might say, was perfected in New Jersey. Authorities consider decoy making uh, a true American folk art. It's something that started here. Nobody knows exactly when it started, but by the early to mid 1800s, you have uh, hunters, uh, sport hunters and market hunters, professional hunters hunting for uh, game to sell, uh, you, carving decoys and using that tool. A typical Jersey decoy is hollowed out. Um, so I didn't nail the pieces together. But any old decoy or any New Jersey decoy usually typically looks like this in the inside. And that is from the gouge, which we have right here, which uh, takes all the, all the insides out of the duck and makes it a lot lighter. I love antique decoys and old decoys. And I look at books all the time of antique decoys and try to copy what the old timers did. This decoy was made in the late 1800s. Um, when you look at a decoy, one thing you want to look at is the lines on the decoy. And uh, Hurley Conklin, who taught Jamie, he always used to talk about fair lines. It's a boat building term. And what that means is that everything flows together, very fair. See how it all flows down right around here? There's no jagged edges to the decoy. And that's when we're carving a decoy, that's what we look at. We'll be carving, spoke shaving away on it, and we'll hold it up and look and make sure our lines are fair. Um, so that's, that's one of the big things we look at when making a decoy. This is a flat bottom decoy. Um, 
and what we normally do is we put a lead weight on the bottom here um, and a flat bottom decoy I've come to like making flat bottom decoys because they float really nice in the water. Billig won a folk arts apprenticeship grant from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts to study underhand. Both are lifelong hunters with a passion for using their own hand-hewn decoys. I use my decoys, so I make my decoy as a working tool. Um, so I pretty much make it so that I can hunt with it. Now I don't think I'd want to hunt ever again with plastic decoys. Um, just because you make them yourself and you take pride in your work and it really means something when uh, you're out there on the marsh and you're looking at your decoys and you're watching a beautiful sunrise on a fall morning and uh, you have some ducks flying in and landing in your decoys. It really, it really enriches the whole hunting experience. If, if they outlawed hunting tomorrow, I'd still go out and throw my decoys out and just watch the ducks land in them. And uh, as a matter of fact, most of the time, uh, I'm a part-time waterfowl guide. Uh, I don't, most of the time, I don't shoot the ducks that I'm allowed to shoot. I just like watching them anymore. You're in effect, it's almost like making a sheet of plywood. It's cross grain. I have techniques I learned from Harry Shores. I learned techniques Hurley Conklin came up with. No one man in one 40-year working lifetime is going to come up with all this, uh, these techniques. But you take a, a good idea from each one, and over time you have it down to a science. It, you know, whether it's a, an Austrian pastry chef or a, 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 a Japanese uh, master pottery maker, 